show on Nickelodeon Skate TV, the only skateboarding show made by skaters for skaters. On today's show, we'll take you on a pool hunt with John Swoop and longtime pool legend Steve Alba. Check out street skating magician Sal Barbier. Visit the planet Earth with Chris Miller and see Rudy Johnson on the Skate TV mini ramp. Next, we go on location to visit Vert Schrauper Bucky Lassick at home and to Venice Beach, California to check in with Block and the MSA. You'll see the best blunders and meet a few skaters who care to make a difference. Hi, I'm your host, Matthew Lynn, and this is my co-host, Skate Master Tate, busting backside at the ranch on his four foot nine inch board and styling in the streets. Up first, a skate TV pool hunt with guide Steve Alba. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. Cowabunga. The idea of slapping some wheels on a wooden plank as a toy has been around for a while, at least since 1910, when children would take apart a roller skate, nail it to a 2x4, and then often attaching a fruit crate as handles, making a crude scooter and using the momentum of a steep hill for an easy thrill. However, it wasn't until the 1950s and the rise of California surf culture for people to start realizing the potential of this style of toy. What do you do when the waves just aren't there? Take to the streets on your brand new skateboard the first properly manufactured skateboards being sold out of surf shops sometime around 1959. In 1963, the first skateboard competition was held in Hermosa Beach, and in 1964, surfer Corky Carroll demonstrated the skateboard on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, bringing national exposure to this West Coast trend. A lot of celebrities started photographing themselves skateboarding with the same energy as celebrities today trying to do TikTok dances. Catherine Hepburn, radical. By 1965, skateboarding was a hundred million dollar industry. And then, like the hula hoop before it, the general population lost interest. The money stopped coming in, and skateboarding was no longer the hip new thing. Going into the 1970s, skateboarding became more of a niche hobby and gradually developed its own subculture. Initially, skateboarding was about thrilling traversal, the challenge of keeping your balance as you roll down the hill. Maybe you put some cones down and try to thread between them. But as it grew in more urban environments, the act of skateboarding adapted into its surroundings. Large concrete foundations became impromptu skate parks. California droughts resulted in a lot of empty swimming pools that you could trespass onto, creating ramps that added a lot of verticality and eventually saw skateboarders catching air. The focus changed from travel to tricks, aerials and ollies and flips and grabs and grinds. Skateboarding became a sport of expression, more in common with figure skating than, say, mountain biking. One of the leaders in this subculture were the Z-Boys. In 1971, Jeff Ho, Skip Englum, and Craig Stesick founded the Jeff Ho Surfboards and Zephyr Productions, a surfboarding manufacturer opening shop in Santa Monica, California, in an area of the city commonly known as Dogtown. One of their first employees was 14-year-old Nathan Pratt, who started in janitorial, then worked his way up to surfboard construction and repair. Pratt became a founding junior member of the store's surf team, competing nationally in advertising the store. They also wound up as the store's official skateboarding team in 1974, but there's one member we'll be focusing on for our purposes, Pratt's childhood friend, Stacy Peralta. In 1975, the Z-Boys competed in the Del Mars Nationals, the first major skateboarding competition since the 1960s, and most of the competitors brought that old-school, 1960s style with them. And then the Z-Boys showed up, bringing a low-to-the-ground style and a lot of attitude. What today we might say was a bit more grunge compared to the ex-hippies that were still sticking around the skateboarding scene. This caused a stir. Some people loved it, some people hated it, but many of the Z-Boys placed. And with that, they were on the map. A series called the Dogtown Articles appeared in Skateboarder Magazine. The Z-Boys became a major trendsetter for skateboarding that would continue to evolve in the following decades. Eventually, the Z-Boys broke up and went their own ways. Stacy Peralta, at one point the highest ranked professional skater, retired from the sport in 1978, barely 21 years old to focus on the business side of things, co-founding Powell Peralta, which, like Zephyr Productions before it, had its own skateboarding team, the Bones Brigade, 
which included a couple dozen members over the years, including a little guy you may or may not have heard of, Tony Hawk. To help promote the team and the company, in 1984, Peralta directed the Bones Brigade video show. The half-hour videotape was the first of its kind, a compilation of skate tricks and routines in public settings, complete with spills and run-ins with the police, an offbeat sensibility and DIY style. There was a market there, with skateboarding so rarely featured on television, being able to see it in action on demand was quite welcome, and the Bones Brigade video show sold 30,000 copies. Not a blockbuster, but for a niche hobby tape, quite exceptional. This excited Peralta, and he would continue directing various skateboarding films throughout the 80s and into the 90s. This is the first half of our stage set. For the other half, we must introduce ourselves to Steve Binder. Not a skateboarder, but a longtime television producer and director. Some highlights include the 1968 Petula Clark special that raised controversy when she touched Harry Belafonte's arm, the first time a black man and a white woman exchanged physical contact on American television. That same year, he also directed what many call the comeback special for Elvis Presley, bringing him back into mainstream pop music after a long stint in Hollywood. This is all great stuff. He also directed this, The Star Wars Holiday Special. Is that unfair to his legacy as an influential creative force in classic television? Absolutely. Is it ever not funny? No, it's not. In the 1980s, Steve Binder and his company, Binder Entertainment, worked primarily in children's television, doing production work on Zoobly Zoo, Pee Wee's Playhouse, and the live action segments of the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. It was during that time that the company was picked up by Nickelodeon, but not for a children's show, but for the very first original program on their evening block, Nick at Night. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Clark, TV critic for Dial Digest. And I'm Kevin Rush, television critic for your TV weekly log, and we are on the television. Tonight on the television we'll be looking at They Called Him Gumbo, a new western series that hopes to launch a new tough guy hero. We'll also be reviewing Where's My Gun? a new action drama in the James Bond mold. And we're going to look at that abrasive new sitcom called Thanks for Nothing. And our Hollywood insider, Ricky Wells, will take us behind the scenes for a chat with the show's stars. And we'll take a look at the popular quiz show Answer or Die. A spoof of review shows like Siskel and Ebert, on the television premiered on Nick at Night as an April Fool special on April 1st, 1989, before continuing in earnest in 1990. Featuring parodies of various movies and television trends, it was... Well, it was probably not the best thing to put alongside reruns of Saturday Night Live and SCTV. John, I've had a lot of fun and everybody here's just been so lovely, especially... Oh, her time was up in more ways than one. It's no Hi Honey I'm Home is all I'm saying. However, what's important is that Nickelodeon now had a working relationship with Steve Binder and Binder Entertainment and it was apparently strong enough for a second show, this time on proper daytime Nickelodeon, something for the kids. Which is probably what you should have done in the first place if you're hiring the Pee Wee's Playhouse guys. But even then, Binder Entertainment would produce something that was a bit out of left field. Unfortunately, the exact genesis of the world's first skateboarding television show is undocumented. I can't tell you exactly whose idea it was. What I do know is that at some point, Binder Entertainment turned to Nathan Pratt, the original Z-Boy, to produce, and Craig Stesick to do production design. And if we're pulling names from Dogtown, well, choosing a director for such a show was a no-brainer. There was one man with more experience filming skateboarding than the next 10 most experienced combined. With Stacey Peralta on board, Nickelodeon's skateboard show really couldn't have been any more authentic. In 1990, the world was introduced to Skate TV. Skate TV. Coming up next on Nickelodeon. On paper, Skate TV is a very simple show. A series of interviews with professional skateboarders across the country, both old professionals from the 70s and fresh-faced newcomers, along with footage from various skateboarding competitions. Tips and tricks for those looking to get into the hobby, and home video footage sent in by viewers. 
That sounds pretty straightforward, but Peralta didn't compromise one iota for the show's tone and style, and so everything is presented in a weird, off-the-cuff, and somewhat irreverent way. For example, those tips and tricks segments are really just three guys hanging around a workbench, cracking jokes and communicating zero educational information as they fuss about with a skateboard. And one of the most important issued equipment things is the helmet. Yeah, we got the helmet. Protect your head. <laughs> you can do this plan for us. <sighs> Clips right on. It's awesome. Nice again. Don't you normally do this with that? Yeah. Many of the interviews are re-edited to be comedic, putting their words out of context for a silly outcome. We asked eight skaters the following question. Is this a good question? It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Tough question. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, what, the, 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 um... You know, that's one of the questions I hear all the time, and I have absolutely no idea. Sometimes the show goes into full-blown art house territory, little student films that get you scratching your head. Skate shops. Yes, skate shops. Skate shops? Skate shops, yes. Why, yes. Why do birds sing? Why do fish swim? Why are some skate shops better suited for skate commerce? Exactly why. Why? Why? Service repair, skate videos, clothing, equipment, service repair, skate videos. Not so fast. Sorry. You've made a mistake. You have made a mistake. Going to bed without dinner? Exactly. Again, please. Again, please? Service, repair, skate videos, clothing, equipment. Service, repair, skate videos. Much better. Pretty quickly, you realize that this isn't a sports show. It's a vibes show. There were two hosts. The first was Gary Hurtado, aka Skate Master Tate, a professional skater, DJ, and rapper. An early member of the skate punk music scene who had worked with Stacy Peralta, contributing songs to his various video projects. Stacy Peralta, he's a friend of mine. I met him at Skate Tokyo back in 79. Was skate for GNS way back then. Now it's incorporated and a company man. Welcome to the deep end, and now here's the beef. Here's the skate master going down, hits a little oil slick, oh, bam, mashed potatoes and beef with a side roll. Check out the, oh, slips out, bam, roll, gets right up. And now the skate TV trick of the week. We have Lord Sala doing a stair car, plants his hand on the bottom stair. Here's another angle, check this out. Bottom stair over, coping grind in slow-mo action, please. Grinds and around, yeah. A very authentic presence for this kind of show. But he was also 30. So to help balance things out for the show's younger demographic, they brought in 19-year-old Matthew Lillard, credited here as Matthew Lynn. Yes, it's that Matthew Lillard. You read it all? In your yeah, time? I read a lot. Do you really? Mm -hmm. Well, like, what kind of books? Um, Charles Bukowski, if you ever heard of him, he's one of yeah, my favorite authors. Yeah, he's a great author. His first television gig, Lillard wasn't from the skating scene. No, he was a serious, capital A actor, easily the most actory actor among Nickelodeon's child hosts around this time. He started performing in school plays starting in the 8th grade, shows like Greed for Gold, Oklahoma, and Can't Take It With You. He co-founded the Thespian Club for Foothill High School in North Tustin, California, and then enrolled in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Pasadena. He founded his own production company, Live and Kicking Productions, and his own theatrical company, The Mean Street Ensemble. Around the time Skate TV was airing, Lillard was working with the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation to stage a production of Tracers, a play about the struggles of soldiers in Vietnam. Lillard was serious business, which is funny because Skate TV was the beginning of him being typecast as various slacker weirdo types. From this show, to Hackers, to Scream, to SLC Punk, to becoming the new official Shaggy for the Scooby-Doo franchise. Are you challenging me? <laughs> as far as I could tell, this really wasn't his scene. He's better at the scripted segments, the surreal skits are more his wheelhouse, but even I can't deny that he has the look of a skate rat. Hey, let's have a seat. Um, so... <laughs> The bulk of the show was shot at the swimming pool of the Pink Motel in Sun Valley, California, which was painted over with art from Kevin Ansel and Ken Jones. Craig called me up and said, come down here and paint this pool. 
It was freezing cold at night, and the wind was blowing so hard, we'd be shooting the paint and we would fly sideways. We painted the shit out of that pool. We finally got it all done, and it was beautiful. Then the skaters showed up. They were like, yeah, let's skate this pool. And I was like, whoa, don't be skating on that shit. I got all bent out of shape. It was pretty funny. I think we did it in three days. It was great. The interviews included a fair mix of the skateboarding old guard and new blood during this time period. Peralta brought in a lot of his friends, including former Z-Boy Tony Alva, as well as his Bones Brigade crew like Lance Mountain, Ray Barbie, Colin McKay, Tommy Guerrero, Jim Thebode, Bucky Lassick, Steve Size, Kevin Harris, Guy Mariano, Ray Underhill, and yes, baby Tony Hawk. And can I just say, Tony, the ponytail ain't working for you. So you're known for issuing an entire new like style of tricks. Uh, when you develop a trick, is it like by accident? How do you go about it? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes I'll do a trick and then it'll turn into something else. Then I'll think, hey, that would be neat. Or sometimes it's just like when I'll be, I don't know, falling asleep or something. I'll think of something and you know try the next day, or just sitting around doing nothing, and thinking about it. <laughs> You probably noticed that this is pretty much a boys club. In fact, only one woman skater was profiled in the show's 13 episodes, Lori Rigsby, in a segment showing that girls can totally do all the stuff guys can do. Of course, we won't show you a second girl doing it. One is enough to say we did a representation. Of course there's not a difference between the equipment that guys and girls use. It's the same boards, the same pads, everything's the same. Okay. And there is at least one unfortunate in hindsight inclusion with Mark Anthony Rogowski, aka Gator, one of the most dominant skateboarders of the 1980s. What kind of music do you listen to? Oh, wow. I'm influenced by all different kinds of music. It's like a. Just all the Motown, and I like Prince a lot, you know. I like the Stranglers a lot from UK, they're pretty good too. On March 20th, 1991, a little over a year after this episode first aired, Rogowski assaulted and murdered 22-year-old Jessica Bergston. Rogowski pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 31 years in prison. On June 14th, 2021, three weeks ago, as of the time of this writing, Rogowski was approved for parole. How this affected the show is, well, not the important takeaway from this tragedy, but I can't imagine the Gator episode saw a lot of rotation afterwards. Skate TV only had one 13 episode season, which wouldn't be a lot for most shows, but it seemed to be more than enough for what Skate TV was trying to accomplish. 13 episodes may have even been too much, as one episode is basically a clip show, re-editing interviews from previous episodes. Initially, Skate TV was paired with another show about young people doing physical activities, Wild and Crazy Kids. The pilots for both shows premiered on the second weekend of January 1990, with Wild and Crazy Kids on the 13th and Skate TV on the 14th. The pilots were then paired together and re-aired on January 21st, 1990 as part of Super Sports Sunday, a weekend promotion showing off the channel's new sports programming with Wild and Crazy Kids first at 10.30, followed by Skate TV at 11. Both shows started airing in earnest on July 4th, 1990, with Skate TV airing on 6.30 p.m. on Saturdays and 11.30 a.m. on Sundays. Not bad spots. However, while both shows were produced on the cheap, Wild and Crazy Kids had broader appeal, being a more general physical activity show that most people could get into. Skate TV, on the other hand, had a very narrow demographic. If you're not already into skateboarding, if you don't already hit the skate parks and have a subscription to Thrasher magazine, then this show doesn't have much to offer you. It's not even that great as an introduction to the sport. It is encouraging to newbies, showing off a lot of rising stars and going, this could be you, and it doesn't shy away from the fact that even seasoned veterans fall off their boards quite a bit. But the show offers very little useful information for those looking to learn. This isn't Skateboarding 101, but instead showing off tricks and interviewing athletes you're expected to already know. Actually, the commercials for this show, the interstitials, had more skateboarding information for beginners than the show proper. 
Get your pads on. It's time to skate. Nickelodeon Skate TV presents You Can Shred, a brash course in skateboarding. Lesson three, wheels. All wheels around, but they're not all the same. Knowing the difference in wheels can improve your skating. Here are the wheel facts from Skate TV. On the side of every wheel is an A number and a millimeter number. The A number measures hardness. The higher the A, the harder the wheel. The millimeter number measures size. The larger the millimeter, the bigger and the wider the wheel. What type of wheel is right for your stick? That depends on the terrain you like to skate. A soft, wide wheel is a good downhill street wheel. It will hug the road like a mag tire from the Motor City. Hard, narrow wheels are good for tricks in the flatlands and for power slides. If you're into noise, harder wheels make for a louder ride. When buying wheels, get your local skate shop dealer's advice and the type of wheel that best suits your style of riding. Skate TV, wheel wisdom on the only network for you, Nickelodeon. And you know what? This is all a thousand percent okay. I mean, that's the whole advantage of cable television at this point. Specialized programming that wouldn't have had a big enough audience for standard network television. Five years after Skate TV, we get an entire cable channel about golf. And golf sucks. Why not have a dedicated half hour for a show made by skateboarders for just skateboarders? Skateboarding is cool. Let them have their space. Skate TV never produced a second season and would air its last on the channel on September 28, 1991. One might wonder what would have been if they had carried the show on for just a few years more, because skateboarding would have something of a mainstream renaissance into the mid-1990s and early 2000s, with the X Games beginning in 1994, the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater video game premiering in 1999, and Jackass, born from skateboard prank videos, would start airing on Nickelodeon's sister channel, MTV, in 2000. It would probably be giving Skate TV too much credit to say that it kicked off this era of skateboard culture, but it certainly didn't hurt. And there was a demand, a healthy niche that was ready to be filled. I know this because for a show that only aired 13 episodes over just over a year and received zero home video release, Skate TV is pretty well preserved. Yes, the show did rerun for half a dozen years on Nickelodeon Game of Sports, the rare non-game show to make it over there. Reggie Jackson's World of Sports didn't even make it to Nick Gas. But do you see that classic Games and Sports logo in the corner of the screen? No you don't, because these are all recordings from original broadcast. Being the first skateboarding show means it's also the only skateboarding show. Meaning if you're into skateboarding, you gotta record it and add it to the collection with the Bone Brigade tapes and the home movies of you and your buddies. As somebody who appreciates the sport of skateboarding, who enjoys watching it but hardly knows anything about it, I didn't get a whole lot out of watching Skate TV for knickknacks, but I fully acknowledge that this was a show that was never made for me. For most of us, Skate TV is a trivia point about where Matthew Lillard got his start, but for a select few, it was a home, the first bit of mainstream recognition for the subculture they belonged to. Made by skaters, made for skaters, as authentic as it gets. It's goofy and irreverent, and a celebration. And I think that's pretty cool. Nick, 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 Next time, we talk about a show that feels like a leftover from the Silver Ball era, and take a deeper dive into cable in the classroom. There's a lot of books on the history of skateboarding culture, but the main one used here was Skateboarding and the City by Ian Borden, a pretty comprehensive look at the history of skateboarding through several different lenses, including urban development, skateboard technology, and pop culture. Also want to shout out the 2001 documentary Dogtown and Z-Boys, directed by Skate TV's director Stacey Peralta, an electric look at the 1970s skate culture that led to everything that came after. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Palparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and vitamin D. Doctor says I need more vitamin D. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, following me on Twitter, and sharing Knickknacks with all your friends. I'll see you next time, and remember, Black Lives Matter.